welcome to our introduction to the first readings for Easter week three. On Monday to Wednesday of this week, we follow the journey of Stephen. Stephen is one of the seven deacons who we heard about at the end of last week. He's appointed to work at table with the Hellenistic, that is the Greek speaking Jewish community. The other one of the seven that we'll come across later in the week is Philip. One of the things that we find with Stephen is that although he was appointed to serve at table, he actually begins doing and saying the same things as the apostles do. He is filled with grace and power, we are told. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. And no one could get a better of his wisdom. He's working miracles, healing the sick, doing all the same things as the apostles do and as Jesus before them did as well. We see very much that Stephen's life is modelled on that of Jesus. And so too that the authorities decide that they need to try to get rid of Stephen because he is being very persuasive towards people and they don't think that this is right. They therefore bribe some men to provide false witness against him. And having begun to turn the people against Stephen, then they surprise him, arrest him, and put him on trial. Again, using the false witnesses as evidence against him. Whilst in Luke's Gospel we don't have evidence of false witnesses, we do see that in the other Gospels, that they do bring false witnesses against Jesus. As we carry on through Stephen's trial, between Monday and Tuesday we miss most of Stephen's defence speech within the Acts of the Apostles. Stephen's speech really is a reinterpretation of history, starting from Abraham, showing how all of history pointed towards the fulfilment of God's promises in the Messiah, and that Messiah being Jesus. Starting from Abraham and showing that actually the promises made to Abraham would not be fulfilled in Abraham's own time, but were now being fulfilled by one of Abraham's descendants, namely Jesus. And we see that as we go through history, the next major stop would be to look at the figure of Joseph. Because it is Joseph who is rejected by his own family, sent into exile, and becomes the prophetic leader who enables Israel to survive, enabling them to become a great nation. And so too the parallel is drawn with Jesus, that Jesus was a rejected prophet whom God had sent to save his people. We also hear in the promises to Moses that God promises Moses that one of the signs that God will be with him is that they will come back to worship in this place. This place meaning Mount Sinai. But Stephen reinterprets that to mean Jerusalem. And that actually it's in that very place of God's dwelling that the people have rejected God's Messiah. We pick up the conclusion to Stephen's speech on Tuesday as Stephen in a broad sweep picks up the prophets and their rejection by the leaders in their own time. And Stephen questions whether any of the prophets had not been rejected. And so too the leadership of the current generation is rejecting the latest of God's prophets and the ultimate final one of God's prophets in Jesus. History for Stephen is repeating itself but not necessarily in a good way because for Stephen they should be acknowledging who Jesus is. In the conclusion to the speech then they all grind their teeth at Stephen. They all want to do something but can't get the better of him. And we see another characteristic sign of the Holy Spirit is that Stephen's face looks like an angel. Stephen too is presented in the mode of a prophet. As Stephen as Stephen wraps up his speech, we see that he sees a vision of heaven thrown open. 
and the Son of Man sitting at the right side of God. This proves to be too much for Sanhedrin, who usher Stephen out, a bit like we see the crowd ushering Jesus out of the synagogue in Nazareth. Whereas Jesus slips through the crowd because it's not his appointed time, the Sanhedrin don't turn into a judicial community, but turn into an extrajudicial lynch mob. We, at this point, get our first introduction to a person called Saul. And everybody lays down their cloak at the feet of Saul, who is said to entirely approve of the killing of Stephen. We are left to wonder whether Saul has had a more major role within the trial that has just happened, or if not exactly what his role is. That is not made clear. On Wednesday, as this scene with Stephen wraps up after his killing, a great persecution of the church starts, and it started really by Saul. It attacks mainly the Hellenistic Jewish community, the Greek-speaking community living in Jerusalem. Everyone disperses to different areas, apart from the apostles who, as it was said earlier in Acts of the Apostles that we saw last week, that their proclamation the gospel remains uninterrupted. But certainly amongst the diaspora community who are in Jerusalem at the time, great persecution is happening. There seems to be a desire amongst the authorities to try to stop the gospel spreading. It's all very well to have these leaders of the Jesus movement in Jerusalem, but they don't want it spreading out to the Jewish communities of the dispersion. We hear that as the church is persecuted, Philip goes out and reaches Samaria. It's there that Philip and the good news is welcomed with great joy. There is an irony that as God's, the followers of God's Messiah are being persecuted in Jerusalem, those in Samaria, who the Jewish people considered heretics, are welcoming the good news. They who were excluded from the Jewish community are welcoming the good news of God's fulfilment of his promises. We stay with Philip on Thursday, when again we're looking at someone excluded from the community, because the eunuch is obviously an important person in his own country. He's the second in line to the queen, who is the ruler of Ethiopia. She has put him over all of her household and over all of her possessions. He's quite clearly well trusted. And we see this also in the fact that the chariot in which the eunuch is travelling has room for at least two people, plus has a driver as well. This is not just any ordinary chariot that we might be used to seeing that had room for one person, but rather quite a spacious vehicle. We get this great scene of Philip running up alongside the chariot and asking questions of the eunuch until eventually he stops the chariot and invites Philip to get in and continue explaining the scriptures to him. The eunuch is important because in general according to the law of the book of Deuteronomy eunuchs were excluded from the people of Israel. They could not worship in the temple not even in the courts of the Gentiles. And yet this eunuch is reading the prophet Isaiah. He'd been up to worship in Jerusalem, who obviously believed in the God of Israel, and was amongst what would be termed the God-fearers, those of a Gentile origin, who were not members of the people of Israel, but nonetheless believed in their God. As we kind of go on, and Philip gets into the chariot, we find that the eunuch is reading the prophet Isaiah. And the passage of the prophet Isaiah he is reading is from the end of chapter 2 and chapter 53 of the prophet, commonly called the fourth song of the servant. The scholar Bernard Doom in the 1800s recorded that in the second part of the book of Isaiah, stretching from chapter 40, there are four songs that could be attributed to the servant of the Lord. In chapters 42, 49, 50, and then final one in 52, 53. We read them during Holy Week, 
with the final one, the fourth song of Servants that the eunuch is reading, being the first reading for Good Friday. The eunuch is reading the text of the Greek translation, or the Greek edition of the Hebrew Bible, often referred to as the Septuagint. As the eunuch reads this, he reads about one sent as lamb to the slaughter, and the words that the eunuch is reading quoted in the book of Acts really lend themselves to an interpretation of the servant as being Jesus. And Philip goes on to explain to the eunuch exactly what has happened in Jerusalem of recent times, how this prophecy is applied to Jesus, and how everything God has promised has been fulfilled. We remember that as the two disciples walk along the road to Emmaus with Jesus, their hearts burn within them as he explains to them all the passages in the scriptures that were about himself. We see that tree played out in the story of Philip and the eunuch, because Philip explains to the eunuch all about Jesus and what has just happened in Jerusalem. The only difference is, this time, it's not Jesus doing the explaining, but the followers of Jesus inspired by the Holy Spirit are going out and bringing that interpretation and that message from God to the ends of the earth. At the moment, it is quite limited because it has only reached as far as Samaria. But nonetheless, we see gradually the Gospels beginning to spread out from Jerusalem and onwards. On Friday, we pick up the character of Saul again. Saul has continued to breathe threats against the nascent Christian community. Don't forget that at this point in time, Christianity is not a separate religion. Christianity is more a group within Judaism. Jesus was a Jew, the apostles and disciples are all Jews, whether they be Hebrew, Aramaic or Greek speaking. Saul goes out to Damascus with letters from the high priest to try and get the arrest of the Christians and stop this movement spreading any further. On the road to Damascus, however, something strange happens because there is a great light from heaven and the voice Saul falls to the ground. And he questions that, this voice, and says, well, Lord, who are you? The very fact that Saul says, Lord, who are you? Tells us that Saul recognises that God is in this vision. But Saul doesn't recognise who God is at this point in time because Saul knows that God is speaking to him. But for Saul, he's been doing the right thing. He's been upholding the law of Moses. He's been looking after the traditions handed down by the elders right from the time of Moses onwards. He's upholding the law. So why is God appearing to him in this way? It's said that Jesus speaks to Saul and says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. If Jesus has ascended into heaven, how is Saul persecuting Jesus? The clear dimension is that Jesus, the crucified and risen one, associates himself very much with the church. Because Saul is persecuting the church, then Saul is also persecuting Jesus as Lord as well. This is one of the clearest affirmations in the early church we get, firstly of the risen Christ being so closely connected to the church that he fully identifies with it, but also that Jesus as Lord as well. Jesus is part of God, not just a great prophet, not just another man, but Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is God. In this conception that Jesus fully associates, fully associates himself with the church, we get Paul's idea, particularly in his letters, first letters to the Corinthians and his letter to the Romans, that Christ is the head of the body, which is the church. That this appearance to Saul on the road to Damascus shows that the church is the body with Christ as it said. The Lord fully 
faithfully associates himself with the church. I think this is a really important point for us today. We can often think of Jesus as far away, of God as distant from us. But throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament as well, God always promises to be close to his people. No more so than Jesus is being fully identified with the church. That any of the persecutions that affect the members of the church affect the Lord as well. It also causes us to think about how we treat each other too. Do we treat each other as if we were treating the Lord? In our words and in our actions, are we looking at what it means to be the body of Christ? The other question to ask is, in what sense is Paul converted? Because we often talk in this moment about the conversion of St. Paul. But Paul did not stop being a Jew. He didn't stop believing in God. So he hasn't converted in that sense from one religion to another because he still believes in God. But he has come to realize that God is in Jesus, that God has fulfilled the promises he made through Moses and through all the ancestors and the prophets have been fulfilled in Jesus. And in that way, we can talk about conversion because Paul has come to a new realization. It's more akin to a prophetic calling that Paul has come to the new realization of what God is doing for him and for his people. So perhaps you could call it awakening or prophetic commissioning might be a better phrase or word to use our uh, concept rather than conversion. Because Paul isn't going to be more moral. Paul was already an upright Jew. He was someone who upheld the law in all its fullness. He was someone who was observant of all the practices of Judaism of his time. Paul was exemplary as a Pharisee. Paul was exemplary in all that he did for God and for his religion. And yet we see that God calls him to a new path to the realisation of what he's doing in Jesus. Finally, on Saturday, we turn back and focus once more on Peter. Peter is going to the town of Joppa, which nowadays is the southern part of the city of Tel Aviv on the coast. Whilst he's there, he heals a man who is crippled like he did at the temple. And then he goes to the house of Dorcas, who has been a great member of the community for many years, until she sadly has passed away. There, Jesus, there Peter raises her to life, just as Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. This isn't resurrection to eternal life, but more a continuation of the present life. What is most fascinating in these two stories of Peter is the Greek word that is used, anastate, which means rise up, get up. Peter resurrects these people from where they are, from cripple and unable to be part of society, from the dead, and puts them back amongst God's holy people. Just as Jesus has risen from the dead, so too, through Peter, Jesus offers that resurrection in that moment to those people. The stories are very much modelled on those of Elijah and Elisha in the books of the Kings. But we see too that Peter doesn't do this on his own account. This isn't his own power. Whereas you see Elisha and Elisha doing this on their own because they are prophets of God. Peter prays first and does everything through the power of Jesus. Peter claims nothing for himself, but as he says to the man begging in the temple, we have neither silver nor gold. What we have, we give you. In the name of Jesus, rise up, be resurrected. Let us too be people of the resurrection.